I'm here to tell a story, a story from my mother, a story not mine, but really vivid in my memory. And this is how the story goes. It is midnight on the 17th of August, 1976, in my hometown called Cotabato City in the south of the Philippines. My parents barely just got into bed when they started to feel some shaking. Slowly at first, then violently, then the light overhead was swinging so wildly, but my father told my mother, stay put, hide under the sheets, because he was so worried that the light would break, shatter, and fall on them. The shaking was so strong that the bed moved forward, the electricity went out, and the walls and the ceiling opened. After the main shaking, quickly, they found their footwear, and they went out of the room, only to be met by devastation. Because where my grandmother and my brother's room was supposed to be was replaced by rubble and just open sky. My father, he had bad eyesight. He didn't have his glasses, so he couldn't do much. But my mother, equipped with footwear, quickly went to the rubble site, and she cried out for help in the Filipino language. Saklolo, saklolo, saklolo. And a neighbor came bloodied, barefooted, but intact. And without any hesitation, she removed her footwear, gave to him, and asked him, please help scour for survivors. And after a few tense moments, my grandmother emerged from the rubble, and behind her, the neighbor, carrying a baby, and handed him over to my mother, still covered in soot and dust, but alive. Relief. And for the first time that night, my mother saw how the moon was actually shining really brightly in the darkness of the night. Let's all take a breather. I needed to. <laughs> okay, let's take a few breaths. Okay, now let's try to reflect what happened there as I was telling you that story. At the beginning, surely some of you felt a little bit intrigued. In the middle, captivated, maybe a little worried, and at the, end, at the end, some relief. And even if you didn't feel any strong emotions, surely you would have felt some curiosity. And that emotion, that signifies that a connection is happening between you and me. And in that process, actually, without you fully being aware of, some knowledge has been transferred. Maybe some information that you will might just remember just enough to Google later. 1976, earthquake, Philippines. Or you might even forget after today. But what you are more likely to remember is that emotional story. The earthquake, the collapse, the cry out for help, and the resolution. The power of storytelling has been studied by a lot of researchers. A study by Maurice, Morris and colleagues on the topic of climate change have found that consistently, narratives that are told as stories outperform factual narrative. Simply put, stories are understood by people in a way that sometimes scientific language might not be able to convey. I'm going to share to you a few facts about our earthquake hazards here in New Zealand. Okay, so to the north, there is one in four chances in the next 50 years that the Hikurangi subduction zone event will occur. And down to the south, there is 75% chance that in the next 35 years that an alp alpine fault might rupture. Okay, what does these statements mean? Maybe for you who grew up in New Zealand would know a little bit because you know what is the subduction zone or perhaps you know where is the Alpine Fault. But for some people who are new to New Zealand, these statements might not mean anything because they cannot relate to it. Disaster stories are help us connect. And these are just not stories. Disaster stories are actually lived realities for the survivors. Now I'm going to share to you a very rare footage. We recovered eight millimeter reels from my cousin's basement not really knowing what would be in them. To our surprise, they contained um, footages of the aftermath of the earthquake. I'm just going to show you three scenes.
My mother and brother walking safely in the open streets. The house that collapsed, split into two. My father walking through the rubble. These disaster stories, they're real and they are tangible. Disasters might not happen so frequently in our lives that where we're presented by facts and figures and probabilities, we might have this wishful thinking, oh, that won't happen to me. But disaster stories remind us that these events do happen. So, if we want to tell stories, impactful disaster stories, however, they are embedded with a lot of important lessons. And for me, my mother's story is actually a vehicle of intergenerational knowledge. I was not born yet when that earthquake happened. And there's a lot of lessons in these disaster stories. I will only share two to you, to you today. So first, what do we do if there is an earthquake? The best thing that you can do when an earthquake occurs is what is within your control. For my brother and my grandmother, they couldn't have done much to prevent the house collapsing on them. But for my parents, they did the right thing. They tried to protect themselves from harm so that after the main shaking, they would be in the best position, uninjured, to go out and help others. A study on the Christchurch Canterbury earthquakes by Nick Horsbull on insurance data have shown that majority of injuries from those earthquakes were actually from falling, straining, and getting hit by objects. This is why we're taught here in New Zealand that if an earthquake happens, we should drop cover and hold. Why? This is the best position, actually, to prevent us from falling, straining, and getting hit by objects. Can't drop. It's okay, just stop moving, because that action alone already prevents the risk of falling. And if you're in bed, don't get out of bed and get hit by a bed. Stay put. And remember what my father said, okay, stay put and try to protect your head. So remember, when an earthquake happens, the best thing that you can do is what is in your control, and that is to prevent yourself from getting injured. Okay, so the next lesson that I want to share to you today is how to cry out for help in Filipino. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, it's a lolo, just in case. It might be useful in the future. Who knows, right? No. But the lesson that I want to share to you, the second one, is about keeping essentials at hand. So for my father, because he had really bad eyesight, what was really crucial was for him to have his glasses. But since he didn't have it, he couldn't do much in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. But for my mother, what was essential was that she had footwear. Because she had that, she could walk through the debris. So essentials could mean having your grab-and-go bag. Not all of us would have a grab-and-go bag at the moment. It's okay. We can all work towards having that bag. But at the minimum, know what is your essentials, what's important for you and know where they are and be ready to grab them when needed. Ever since I heard my parents' story, I have made it a habit that when I go to bed at night that I would have my footwear, slippers, um, and glasses nearby by my bedside. So remember, what is important for you? Where is it? And be ready to grab it when it's needed. So that in case of an emergency, whether you're at home, at work, or even now, you would know where these things are and be ready to go. Okay, so these disaster stories have wisdom in them. But for a disaster story to be impactful, it has to have the right components. So how to tell a disaster story? First is to emphasize the human experience. So your story, your disaster story, should have the people as the focus, so whether it's the individuals or the communities, share their experience, share their emotions, make them relatable, talk about their struggles through the disaster. But what's really important when we're telling disaster stories is not to step at the disaster. It cannot just be about the sadness and the devastation. 
we have to look forward. We have to incorporate aspects of resilience, which is why embedded with practical lessons. So now your story, after focusing on the individual or community experience, add in actions and decisions. What did your characters do? And what are the things that they did that your listeners can emulate in the future? But importantly, is to balance. Okay, so your stories don't over sensationalize it with graphic details. Don't embed it in lessons that your audience forget that it's actually a story. So remember, balance your disaster story. Okay, so to end my talk, what I really want to share to you, if you can take anything away from me today, is that stories matter. Especially when we want to motivate people towards preparing for disasters, they are our way in. They are great tools that we can start having those conversations. So I want to encourage you all to try it out, to tell your stories. You might think, oh, actually, I don't have a disaster story to tell. But no, you do. Everybody in this room has experienced something in recent history that we might all want to soon forget. But actually, it's very important that we tell our stories to future generations. No worry, I'll help you start that story. Okay, so start that story. And it goes like this. It was the year 2020. <laughs> Continue that disaster story. <laughs> Better yet, call it your resilience story. And the, in that story, embedded with lessons of survival, lessons of kindness, and lessons of resilience. Thank you.